That's one thing that's always amazed me is most people who are in real estate don't even, 10 years in, they don't really even get it's a business they're running. They think they're doing real estate deals like it's a hobby. It's, it's a company. It's a business. We have a large number of assets that are free and clear. There is no debt. You're like, oh, that's crazy. You should re-leverage it. And it's like, okay. Well, after there's a crash, young man, come back and talk to me then. Let's talk about what's going on right now, the market today. What's what's your take on the market right now? I, oh, I absolutely love the market right now. It, it brings a lot of joy. I, so there's like a million statements allegedly Warren Buffett said, most of which he never said. I, like, I like the books by Warren about how to trade stocks. Detail, he never traded stocks in his entire career. He right. buys controlling interest in companies. The one that he said, and I think he actually said it, is when people are greedy, be fearful. Right. And when people are fearful, be greedy. And you and I, I mean, and it's unfortunate because we know friends that are going to be caught in this. When everything was going crazy in 20 and 21 and early 22, they're just doubling down, leveraging, 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 leveraging. It'll never go down. What could go wrong? Where the people who've been around, I mean, right. this is my my fifth downturn I've been involved with in my career. You know, we're we're scaling back and out. And because we only buy for return and we're looking at how do we maximize the returns? And the biggest way to maximize your returns is not to lose money. So now when the market starts to go down, we're we're very excited. And then, you know, there's so many things out there. I mean, geez, with the social media, it's just crazy out there, as you know. You know, be like, oh, well, the next big crash is coming. It's like, OK, hold on. 2008, could it happen? Absolutely. Is it likely? Oh, heck no. And people are like, why? OK, well, the first thing is they're all claiming their charts show it's going to be a crash. It's like, like, let's go to the big chart. So the big chart in the United States goes back to 1765. There's actually global charts that go back 6,000 years. But the reality in the United States, we've had four major crashes. They occur every 60 to 90 years. Starting in 1765, well, we crashed in 1790. Not too hard to figure out why. We went bankrupt fighting a revolutionary war. Right. You know, and then we had another crash in 1872, again, following the Civil War. The, the next one was in 1932. So again, we're consistently 60, 70, 80 years apart. And then there, then there was 2008. So if we're going to be charts, the charts show that there is no big crash coming. They're not back-to-back -back events. And I have a theory about, a theory about why that is always 70, 80 years. That's What's that? Simply that it's the age span of the humans. Yeah. They just simply forget. One, like the people who lived through it forgot about, uh, now are no longer around, no longer around to, 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 to raise the warnings. They're out of the workforce. The new generation is saying, what could go wrong? Could, they don't know. They don't know anymore. And boom, they make the same mistakes again. All over again. And, and then, you know, we look at then the other dynamics. I mean, obviously, the last one, the the... Wall Street is always involved. Wall Street is the main one who buys the um, secured loans. So the, the government insured, government guaranteed loans, all those alphabet soup loans, Wall Street buys them. Right. Wall Street still buys them. In 2008, just prior to that, Wall Street got greedy, which is not what they normally do and because they forget too, Jack. Wall Street got greedy because they're just bookies. If you're bookies, you never lose as long as you had your bets. Well, they went in. And Wall Street got greedy, but what they bet on is they bet on the debt, which was bad debt that they were creating. So when it, when the music stopped, they were dead. This time it's completely different. Wall Street didn't back the bad debt. Wall Street bought the asset. Wall Street right. is now a large owner of it. So the first thing that does, that softens any bottom because you have a huge amount of properties that are free and clear or low leverage by Wall Street that they're not selling. Yeah, there's the open door and the Zillows, et cetera, and kind of for people watching right now, what if Zillow was never about real estate, even kind of at all? What if it was entirely a stock play? Because the stock went up $20 billion and they lost $780 million. I'd take that trade any day. Because I would put to you, being from Wall Street, Zillow really didn't care if they made money or lost money flipping. What it did to the stock and coincidentally, large amounts of options for the leadership for the leadership were available to them to be sold. So you're saying basically saying uh, so uh, Zillow um, by by going into the real estate space and buying large amounts of houses, their stock while well, during the boom, of course, their stock were through the roof through the roof which allowed them to allow their CEOs and their, their their leadership team to look really good and getting lots of stock options. And hey, losing $700 million is not a bad thing. Chump change to them. And so I hear people all the time, you know, you know, you talk to students like, well, blah, 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 blah. I don't understand. It's like, okay, hold on to the last sentence. That's the only part that was true. You don't understand what Wall Street's doing because they're not playing our games. 
They, they play different games. I'm from there. Yeah. You know, so they right now the markets are propped automatically because of the fact that they're that. And then you know the investor community. You know, in 2005, it would have been normal. And we met tons of people. They owned five houses in Las Vegas. They put a total of ten thousand down for all five. You know, the uh, the rents are twelve hundred a month. Fourteen hundred a month would be the uh, the debt service, and two of them are vacant. So they're bleeding money. You know, just bleeding money every month, and they've got no skin in the game. You take the exact same thing today. That guy or gal with the five houses in Vegas, they put four hundred thousand hard cash in. Yeah. They're renting them for two thousand a month, and their PITI is twelve hundred. You're not walking away from that when it falls fifty or hundred grand. So the whole investor walk away is gone. And then the next thing is the homeowners. Most of them, yeah, look, no one's happy the value of their home went down, but most of them are sitting on equity, but more importantly, they're sitting on a two and a half to three and a half, four percent loan. They can't rent their house for their payment. So they're just not moving. So so there are no dynamics that yeah. say we have an eight coming. What we have right now, I think, is we're in the midst. And the market isn't shifting, people. It already shifted. Cause the psychology shifts, and then three to six months later, the numbers start to shift. It already shifted. That's, a, right. that's one of the problems with reporting services. They're great. But when you're giving the numbers, you're giving me the numbers, but you're not giving me what's happening in the street. Right. The psychology motion has shifted. And so normally we'd be looking at most markets, a 10 to 20% downturn. And look, I know the news reports the national numbers like it's what's happening where you live. Some areas are more, some are less. And with social media and the massive infusion of negativity from the, the main media, um, I could see it being 20 to 30 in some areas because based that's, on emotions, not already, numbers. Like Arizona, it's already there. Yeah. But, uh, right now yeah. in Arizona, we're falling a quarter to a half a percent per week yeah. on residential. And then, you know, the other thing is keep in mind, if, you're, if you've learned how to invest properly, you've never focused on the macro, you focused focused on the micro. And, and what I mean by that, Jack, is look, we're buying a specific house in a, on a specific street in a specific neighborhood that we know well, and we're buying the one that was undervalued. And, and we're already seeing several people that, you know, in March, you know, the house was $350. Uh, today, it's $310-ish. Most people won't sell it for way less than that, but we're already finding the ones, even on MLS, that'll take 230, 225, 235. And then we come in, we work with capital investors and our own money. So then we come in, we buy it cash, or we buy it with a 20 or 25% down payment in a long term fixed rate loan. And if you've got good credit, loans are available. And if you don't have good credit yourself, you use someone else's. Someone else's yeah. But before we go into that, let's. let's, yeah. let's Let's roll back for just a second and unpack a couple of things we just talked about. So first of all, I 100% agree with uh, with your with the entire assessment. For example, we just re uh, like earlier this year and last year we refinanced several of our properties and uh, and uh, even our own house and, and and a vacation home and and some commercial stuff and so on. And I can I mean anyone that ask anyone out there that ever. Um, that ever refinanced anything in the last couple of years, if they were giving a liar loan, if they were giving, uh, being, being given a, a loan that no documentation loan or anything like that, or no money loan. I mean, yes, there's the FHA and those kind of loans and they're legit and for veterans and all this kind of stuff, uh, or the VA loans and so on. But the normal person that is not a veteran and they, they, you have to put money down. They scrutinize your credit. They scrutinize your income. They scrutinize everything like crazy. And which is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing because that's what's not happened in 2005, six, seven. And it's happening now, which, which means that everyone that bought right now has been qualified. Now, some of them might lose their job right now. Some of them might have to move right now. Some of them will be in distress, but it's in no proportion to anything that happened in 2008. Oh, you're absolutely it's, right. It's more it, like a normal, that happens in every normal recession that some people get in distress and then they have to, they have to sell their property. That's where investors often come in and actually are of help. Right? We're not taking deals away from people. We are, we're, we're helping them out of a difficult situation yeah, and saving them from a foreclosure. Yeah, well, we, I don't even do that, but the, yeah, we, I do we, land flipping. But, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we've, got a, we've got a nice opportunity coming up in both the land yeah. and the, the real estate, um, the residential, some in commercial, but more in the residential and the land where, yeah, there's, there's a small percentage that are in trouble. Now, I, I know some of the podcast guys, they act like there's a tsunami wave of foreclosures. But a lot of that is also driven from just 
who he who, who, who screams the loudest is being heard in this, right. in this world that we live in right now. Yeah, right? absolutely. And and they just disregard that you know the the numbers that were released in the beginning of November for October um, showed 2.7 percent of residential real estate loans were in distress, which is the lowest number in 40 years. Right. So the screaming doesn't match the truth. Yeah, but the screaming gets you eyeballs, and the and, eyeballs gets you whatever sponsors and 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 and. and Dopamine because you get to see, oh, my reel has been seen right. five million times or something. Right, like where that. my yeah. dopamine's on the return on my portfolio. That's right. Not in my still. not in my eyes on my on my <laughs> podcast. Right. Which is they're both good. It's just for people, it's like, you know, I think it's okay if you and I talk about the truth, which is why I love the conversations you and I have had over the years are great. Yeah. I mean, we sit down for lunch and we're both at some point going, Oh, we're like an hour past what we were supposed to be. Right. People oh. are buzzing. It's like, where are you? You're supposed to be somewhere. Exactly it's like, right. I'm talking with my buddy, Jack, leave me alone. Right. Exactly. So yeah, I love those conversations too. So as a result of that, that, that small percentage of people that are like, for some reason or the other, they need to move or they want to upgrade. They basically bite the bullet. But now because of the run up, I mean, I think prices in states like Idaho, Arizona, Florida and Texas and so on went up so something like over 40 percent within like 18 months or so. 12, Massive. 18 months. They have th that is equity. Right? That is equity. So prices have to go down below that for them to have to sell at a loss. Right. And. So as a result, people starting to come to the realization that uh, do you see it? It sounds like you see it that way, that due to realization sometimes, well, I just I'll just sell for less. I'm still making money. Yeah, still making money. Stuff make, instead of making 200 grand, I'm making 80 grand, but I'm still walking away with 80 grand and I get to move where I need to move. I get to uh, do what I need to do in life. Yeah, because we do our quick looks, you know, I'd be like, yeah, you're asking five. Uh, the reality, though, is in 18, you bought it for 280. You haven't refied it. Uh, you'd like five, maybe four fifty, but hey, I'm going to try it three twenty, and and maybe we can find a low number that works for you because I don't know your circumstances. But there's lots of people. It's like, yeah, I'd like to make, like you said, I'd like to make two hundred, but I need to move for X reason, and seventy or eighty grand is better than nothing, and I need. Yeah. Because there's still always people who just need to move. So we're looking at that that small number. Yeah, but, and but those numbers like work. Say, why do you sell? Why do you not just rent it out? But not everyone wants to rent. There's people who have this thing in their mind that rental meanings that they have to wake up at midnight and clean toilets. And that's just obviously not true, but, but right. go, and it, go it's, change their minds. Yeah, it's really learning to, to put our, our self in the other person's shoes. Um, and for many of them, it's like in their mind, well, I can't get a new loan if I have this loan. And I can't afford two payments. And they're just, you know, they haven't paid for the education. They've chosen not to learn not really aware that they've made this conscious choice, but they have. Yeah. And so because of that, they don't see the options that are available. So then when an investor comes in and offers them a below market offer, which is what you need to do as an investor. Right. Otherwise um, you can't make money. Otherwise you can't make money. I mean, we just came out of an era where another generation had to learn that real estate doesn't always go up forever and re-leveraging everything you own nonstop for eternity is not a good plan. Um, you know, just take the cash out and put it in, take the cash out, put it in. That, that all works until it stopped going up and it stops going up on average every 10 to 14 years. So this is a normal downturn is normal. And, you know, the new, the veterans get it. Some of them forget it, but the new people is always like, oh my God, it doesn't go up anymore. No, 40%, 18 months is not, not normal. normal. <laughs> right. Great. So let, let me now bring up something completely different. So we did a little research on you and obviously we know each other forever. And I know you have educational programs and things like that. I went on your website. There's a calculator for sale. What is that about? Oh, calculators. Well, here's the reason why. A lot of people that we deal with are older or low tech. When I deal with an older or low tech person who doesn't understand how to use their own phone, the last thing I want to do if we're doing calculating and negotiation is to start putting numbers, especially on my mortgage calculator on my phone, which is where I would use it. I will literally take out the old school calculator for the old school seller and help them to put the numbers in so they can see why we're arriving at those numbers. So you got to remember, a lot of people that are older don't trust technology at all. And that's, right. a, that's a good chunk of our database. And also... My capital investors, and, and you know, we've raised over six hundred million dollars for placement in residential real estate. Most of my capital investors, they're not fifty; they're sixty to ninety. Mm -hmm. They're far older, far thing, and they love. I don't use it every time, Jack, but if I need to flip around that old school calculator, 
and we don't use an HP. We use one that's called the Real Estate Master. I think it's version two. I don't remember for sure. I got about 10 of them laying around. If I flip it around, it looks like a regular calculator. So it doesn't look like a scientific calculator, but it's got the buttons where I can put in the future value. I can put in the, in determine the mortgage payments, et cetera. Okay, cool. So, that, so that's why it's still there. All right, cool. Yeah. No, I like that. I was like, wow, that's an interesting thing. And it makes perfect sense. Because again, a lot of people watching this might be younger generation and, uh, and they're like, yeah, just use your phone thing. But guys, remember, there is a, a lot of your investors, particularly usually investors are not all, I don't know, the crypto billionaires or crypto millionaires and, and young kids. They're often, they're often the, the people that worked for 40 years on something in a job or running a business. And now they arrived at an age where they're where they're financially free, financially abundance, but they're very careful with their money and they don't, they don't, they're still not very savvy at technology. So it's a great point. Yeah. And it, it just, it, it, <coughs> it, you know, for me, learning old school by, you know, Tommy Hopkins, who's a dear friend and Zig Ziglar and all these older sales guys whose techniques are still being taught all the time. I, I love all the time. Like they go, Oh, you need to see so-and-so he's this new sales wizard. And I'm look, looking at presentations like, that. okay, that is like verbatim 60% Tommy Hopkins, 20% Zig. He has a few innovations, but almost all of this is just the old master's work, right. which is how it always is. Of course. Um, I, I wish they'd give a little more credit to the people whose information they're teaching. True. Um, and that's one of the I've always respected about you, you give credit to where it belongs, is, um, you know, you've got to be really great at putting your feet in other people's shoes. Right. Um, and so a lot of our investors are older, they're not technology savvy. And so we keep it as simple as they need it to be. I can always go more complex, but I can't undo it if I go too complex. Right. And a confused mind always says no. Yeah. Well, and, and then we get a lot of older, you know, older people who, you know, want to sell us the house on our financing at a low rate, you know, so I can show them, well, this is how we're going to get you that, that amount of money per month. And this is how it's going to work. And it's just simpler form. It's not, it's not a tool we use all the time for sure. Uh, but when we do need it, we have it. Yeah, no, very great. Now, that's a very <laughs> wise statement too, that, uh, let me repeat that for everyone. This, uh, that once you go too complicated, you can't go back because once you confuse them, it's really hard to backpack. Yeah, yeah I, I remember that I, vividly, actually, because I had a conversation with that investor yesterday. A um, couple, three years ago, we bought a multifamily property because we flip land, but we also invest in multifamily. Yeah, sure. And, um, and we bought that and they wanted to invest. And I was talking to them about investing and I was explaining to them. And I think I just explained, you can do this and then you can do that and you can do this. And, and I went like down the rabbit hole of like where I geek out about this stuff. And, <laughs> and I'm just like, and at the end they're like, okay, let us get back with you. And the next day is like, you know what? We're not going to invest. Right. And it's like, crap, what did I do? Well, luckily <clears throat> is that they then saw that this deal was a huge success and they kind of regretted not investing. So in this time they came around, but even there, they're like, okay, we, we, we invested because we missed out last time, but we still have a few questions. So this time I remembered to answer them very simply. And as a result, they just invested in the second deal right away within right. a month in, in two yeah. different deals. So yeah, it's such a wise thing. It, it, it's, you know, so like right after I've done an event, I literally tape on my computer, mine, an old piece of paper, no teaching. Because when I'm negotiating to buy the property, when I'm negotiating to put somebody in a property, when I'm negotiating to raise money, I can't reverse when I talk too much. And, and what I'll do is if I get talking, especially if I get excited and I want to share is I just start putting out so much information that I'm creating objections they'd never thought of. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, look, you just you keep it step by step methodical. And most of my capital investors, they had very little understanding of everything we did. They just need to know that, hey, this is safe, it's secure, it's long-term, it's cash flow, wow, tax benefits, a really good rate return, and there's long-term going to be growth, we're in. We don't need all the details to say yes. Now, I've got this, just, you know, at this point in my career, I've got thousands of details I can bring in, but I'm going to bring in none of them until I need to. Right. It, it's just, I'm going to hold back that information so I don't confuse them. And, right. and, and the reality is, you know, if they were massively great practitioners of what we did, they probably wouldn't be placing money with me unless they were just at the end of their career or they'd had a big personal issue where they simply weren't going to put the time into anymore. Right. The people who, who I find that again and again now that we're doing a lot of multifamily is the people that are very successful. They're very successful because they're experts in one thing. And that one thing might not be money. 
That one thing might be trading cars, or having a car dealership. That one thing might be having a cosmetic company. That one thing might be, thing that doesn't mean automatically that they're savvy about how to invest their money in real estate. Yeah. They usually uh, just, just pass it on to a financial planner who gives them some advice that usually is like one financial advantage, advan, uh, uh, advisor told me that this is like, um, we win, uh, this, uh, like this, the stock Wall Street wins, we win, two out of three ain't bad. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that, That's kind of like their internal saying. So. Right. And, and we work, you know, I'm from Wall Street. We work with a, um, a lot of capital investors that would be deemed country club money, which is, you know, the million, $2 million placement. Um, a lot of family office money, which is that 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollar placement. And they basically, they're exceptional at what they did. They have their their business, which is usually a bricks and mortar business. Then they've done it for, like you said, 30, 40 years. And, and just what's happened is they have more excess capital than they have capacity to put it into what they do. Mm -hmm. And so then they look for people and many of them have just over the decades, just the constant underperformance by Wall Street, the constant misrepresentation of what they're going to do, um, you know, the, just the blue skying over and over again is they're looking more and more to the smaller boutique operators, boutique firms. We are actually a private equity company, but the more boutique because they just like that we have more skin in the game. And what I mean by that is, you know, Wall Street financial planners work mainly on a, on a fee, asset to management or a fee right. per trade where we work on a percentage of earnings. And so if I don't earn any money, I don't get paid. I mean, I have to manage prop the portfolio for free. So coincidentally, for 33 years, we made money every year. Funny how that works out. If if the operator only gets paid on profits, there's always profits. Absolutely. Yeah. That's how we structure our deal. Too. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's, it's what people want. And so we have a lot of people who will just place that excess capital and you just keep it. You know, we have a script. We have an outline that we do and we present, but you just keep it on track. And then when you need to, certainly when you're more experienced, you can deep dive and answer harder and more esoteric uh, expressions of interest, what people would call objections. But most of the time, that's not what we're doing. It's just, just vanilla. Just keep it how it is. It's a great offer. It's just like what you do. It's great. Don't, don't complicate it that which is simple to entertain right. your own mind. Now, you have a very unique way of looking at at wealth and money and your own kind of you always say like your old style conservative and thing but and debt and those kind of things can you tell us tell me a little bit about how you look at like you talk already right now we talked multiple times people over leverage people do this people do that what's your take on like what's kind of a, the ideal way that somebody should should build their wealth from a leverage point of view? Great question, Jack. And I think what I do is, is when I say old school is obviously I'm taking the modern, but the old, I look at real businesses. Cause that's one thing that's always amazed me is most people who are in real estate don't even 10 years in, they don't really even get it's a business they're running. They think they're doing real estate deals. Like it's a hobby. It, it's a company, it's a business. And so when you look at traditional real businesses, publicly and privately traded in 18, 19, 20, 21, real businesses, 95 plus percent of real businesses were all doing the same thing, jettisoning all bad debt off the books. Um, if they were publicly trading, buying back their own stock, which is paying off debt, building up war chests when it made sense, strategically long-term holds, refinancing them, but not pulling cash out, refinancing them strategically on, on long-term debt. So they were putting their house completely in order because the markets are at the top and that's when everybody who's been around know they're coming down. Mm -hmm. And then you see, I call it seminar land for lack of a better word. And it kind of like seminar land. The idea is when you're at the seminar, every single thing works magically. But I step out the door and I go into the real world and the real world, a bunch of stuff from seminar land doesn't work like they described it. And so in, in the real world, I've got to operate like a business. You know, I don't just spend money like crazy. I don't over leverage my assets. So we, I mean, I've been doing this, the private equity company I formed 33 years ago. I started doing real estate 42 years ago. So it would make sense as a 33 year old private equity company. We have a large number of assets that are free and clear. There is no debt. People are like, oh, that's crazy. You should re-leverage it. And it's like, okay, well, after there's a crash, young man, come back and talk to me then. See, because I don't pay, ma I like the innovation, but I don't pay a lot of attention when I see huge flaws in the business model of people who haven't thrived through a crash. I mean, as you know, it's one of the reasons you, know, you use the word legendary, which a lot do. People say I'm too humble for my own good. But 
you know, eight, nine, and 10, my company thrived when everybody just about yeah, went so, bankrupt. So did we, yes. Yeah. I mean, we thrived, I, you know, and, and nine, 10, 11, 12 were the best years of our business. And we had probably at the time, because uh, Wall Street hadn't been in yet, we probably had the largest portfolio of single family homes in Arizona going into the crash. We were at 91% perform and stay. Over five years, we had a 9% turn rate, which is lower than normal historical numbers would be, because normally you would turn over five years more than 9% of your portfolio. Right. Because we provide home ownership, and all, but people did when times are bad. They weren't in toxic loans. We hadn't buried them. They just hunkered down. Now, on the on the debt side, the personal lifestyle. So turn rate means, in this case, that they sold the property? Or, uh, or tr turn rate would mean the they, they moved out, friendly, unfriendly, or cash out. Okay. So one of the three. Um, and that's the decision of the person of the resident in the property. That usually is higher than 9%. Yes. Yeah, much more. Much higher. So we were, yeah, but because we have a great model. On our multifamilies, we thrive for 33% of things. So if we can get, if we can keep two thirds of our tenants in year after year, yeah, that's great. That's great on multi. Yeah, multi in, in, like most the, most multifamilies have fifty percent or six fifty to sixty percent of the people move every single year. It, so. And it's, it's why we did our model, you know, with the single family home portfolio and providing the resident ownership is because you know I never had anybody move and go, wow, my rental home of my dreams for thirty years. No, my fourplex. Yeah, you know, it's like no, the home of my dreams. Yes. And then what we did, I mean, you know, so in the eight, nine, which is no different than any year, but, you know, in that six, seven era, you know, they were literally 40 FICO points away from a $500,000 loan. And I put them into a $200,000 home that they could afford. Mm -hmm. So then when things went bad, they could still stay and pay. On, on the personal level and on the business level, so people always have like, yeah, well, I need 10000 a month, 20000 a month, 50000 a month. Whatever. I need this number a month to, to be financially free. And... I'm always like, really? What's that number based on? Well, I got a five thousand dollar mortgage, and you know, two one thousand. It's like, okay, well, what if you had no debt? Oh, well, that's impossible. Well, almost every single client I have has no consumer debt. So literally, almost every multimillionaire, decamillionaire, and above that I know has no mortgage on their personal residence, no mortgage on their office buildings, no build mortgage on their manufacturing plan, no mortgage on the second home, and they don't have car loans. Debt is only good if you can fix it and control it and someone else pays for it. All other debt, all consumer debt is bad. And people just, you know, they want the instant gratification, the instant life. But the reality is if you would live within your means for three to five years, you can live beyond any means you ever thought possible, especially when you do stuff that Jack Bosch teaches, stuff that John Burley teaches, right. um, where you can, you know, when you ramp up the income, you don't ramp up the expenses. I mean, literally, our family's been in the same home for 32 years. It's a great home. I mean, it's not a $10 million house on the side of a mountain or above the ocean, but it's a great family home. Um, you know, we've owned four office buildings in 33 years, and all of them, three of them, literally somebody came when it wasn't on the market and offered me far more money than I thought it was worth. And I said, sure, and took the money and moved. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, one of the biggest things when people look at how do I get out and be financially free one is, yeah, we want to turn the faucets on. And, and the old analogy with bathtub economics, you got this bathtub and you got to turn the faucets on. But most people's bathtubs, first of all, the drain's open. But second, they got all these holes on the bottom. So the first thing is, you know, let's flip the drain down like you would do at home taking a bath. And then let's fix the holes. Because in many cases, it's easier to do that than it is just to turn the faucets on harder and harder. As a matter of fact, I have the book Forever Cash has an illustration of exactly that. There's a bathtub with the holes and the, the, and, and the chapter goes exactly about that. Yes, we, we see eye to eye. Well, most, so there's, there's the word out there is like, yeah, but why do you have your house free and clear when you could get a four right now, a 7% loan and then have it produce 15%? And that math makes sense but it still doesn't make sense if that investment that you invested in goes bad. Right? Yeah, and, all of a sudden and, you're responsible for it, and that's where people come. Right, down. and I, and I, <coughs> two parts to me on that. It's first of all with the guy who, who a gal who tells me that's like, okay, Mr. Spock, you know, Mr. Logic from Star Trek. Do you have any money on a credit card that you don't pay off in full every month? Well, sure. Okay, so you don't get to play the interest arbitrage leverage game because you already proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're incapable. Because if your carrying balance is on your charge card at 25%, because you can't pay them off, um, you don't get to play the interest arbitrage game. Because most of money's success, 
If you study the true masters, not not podcast, wannabe, I did 10 real estate deals in my life and I know how to drive people to a podcast so I'm an expert. You're not. If you look at really wealthy people, if you look at the great masters in history, money is primarily about psychology and emotions. Absolutely. Not about asset classes and money. I mean, I've, I've made money in lots of asset classes. I prefer sure. the asset class of, of real estate over others for lots of reasons. The main thing is it moves in slow motion and I don't have calls on my margins, meaning it doesn't matter if, if the property is worth 300, if I owe 300 and it's worth 500 or 200, as long as I make a thousand dollars a month, what its value is today is irrelevant. And that's not true in other asset classes because they call the loans in. Um, it's about the psychology and emotions. And there's something that's incredibly freeing for men and women to know that, wow, so my home is free and clean forever? Yes. And if you learn how to do what you're doing, you don't need to be putting at risk your family's home, your office buildings. You don't need to put this stuff at risk to try and tweak a couple other pennies. And the other thing is, I'm from a Wall Street, stride, Wall Street side, so if I need more money, I don't try and kill my golden gooses and take the cash out of them. I pick up the phone, I make some phone calls, and I raise more money. I get paid for the placements. I know most real estate investors are used to paying for their money. My money pays me to place it because I come from real money people, Wall Street. So we right. get paid to place our money. We don't pay for the money. And then if I need more money for a project or a deal or a get building— paid to place your money. Don't pay for the money. Love that. Yeah, because so seriously, when I first started hearing the real estate stuff in the late 70s, early 80s, like, wow, this sounds good. And I drank the Kool-Aid, but it's kind of like going, this is really hard. I mean, this guy says found a good deal and the money will show up. Well, I found some good deals and the money didn't show up. And, you know, I'm trying to buy properties and, and most good realtors won't give me the time of the day. And, and why would they? I'm not real. I don't have money. I don't have capital. You know, when I then, you know, spent my years in, in the financial industry it just completely changed because they were like going, look, asset classes are relevant. This entire game, all investment games are about one thing and one thing only, money. And if you don't got it, the game is hard or you can't get in. Right. Real estate without money is hard. Real estate with money is easy. So what, you know, when we teach, what we teach is like, look, I love if you're new because if you're new, I don't have to break your bad habits that you think are good habits. But your portfolio and your performance shows clearly that what you know doesn't work properly because you don't have what you want. Even, and, I, even we say that with the land flipping side of things, because in land flipping, we teach people how to make deals happen without money. Like it's because again, we're dealing with these people that don't want their properties anymore. Right. They don't care. And so our students put hundred thousand dollar pieces of land on a contract for 25 grand and then go wholesale them for 55 grand. Right. But we teach them that as step one of a wealth strategy. We teach them that as a way to make money because for the long term wealth, you need money. You need money. And, and, right. and that, we so have, we're, we're essentially saying still the same thing. Yeah, you just, are. It's a, and, and we have several several of our, my students who have portfolios who are Burley Century Club members do your model very, very well. And what they do is they do the land model, but they do the land model with large amounts of investor capital to deploy. So then they can come in and they can buy everything that makes sense because they have the coin. Right. And then they can flip it. And, and do what they want. And they use that money as a twofold to make more money for their investors and more money for themselves so they can then buy more of the multifamily or the single family home portfolio. What most people don't see is that one strategy doesn't have, doesn't have to be the end of it. it. It can be a means to an end to get another strategy going, or you can combine strategies. And again, many of our students do exactly that. Uh, they, they pool money from investors and then with that, they can get more deals done but it ultimately puts more money into the investors and their pocket, as you said. And so they're basically using one method in order to make, to accomplish yet ultimately another goal because most people don't. And many of our students goal is to ultimately own like a large office building, a right. large multifamily, but you don't just wake up one morning and say like, let me buy that $15 million property because you don't qualify for it mostly. Right. You don't have the experience for it. You don't have the capital for it. You don't know how to raise the money for it. So it's a process to get there. And that makes total, makes total, total sense what you said. Oh, it does. And you're exactly right. Because I remember, you know, having in the in the mid-late 80s with, with people who, 
who managed tens of billions of dollars back then, which today would be, you know, hundreds and hundreds of billions equivalent. And, and they're going like, you know, and they're like, okay, John, I like this real estate because I was trying to get them to be investors. So explain to me what the plan is. It's like, well, we're going to get a little bit of money and then we're going to buy some properties and then we're going to fix them or not fix them. And then we're going to sell them. We're going to make money. And then we're going to build that up. And then we're going to buy um, some rental houses that will hold for the long term. And they're going to be kind of like going, well, why don't you just raise the money and buy the houses that you want to start with? Why do you want to waste five or 10 years building this up when you could just do it today? Because most people don't have access to the money. Now, right. you talk to Wall Street, Wall Street has the money. But then again, most people uh, don't have the experience and knowledge on how to approach Wall Street. Yeah. And so most of my capital investors aren't from Wall Street at all. They're just, you know, the the great book, The Millionaire Next Door, which we were actually a part of the study as a planner. I was. Oh, cool. And um, The Millionaire Next Door was just the idea is that there's people all around you. You also have been featured in Donald Trump's book, right? Yeah. Uh, Wealth Building 101. Um, Donald Trump back in 06. Um, I met him through uh, events we used to speak at for the Learning Annex and Success Resources. So around the world. And he was the first million dollar speaker. Wow. Um, he got paid a million dollars. I remember sometimes, you know, as I'm getting ready to go on, I'm, I'm following the, the guys like, hey, John, no pressure, but, you know, you need to cover that right now. Uh, no pressure at all. It's like, hey, they're introducing me. You're not, you, I know you think you're helping Mr. Promoter because you're desperately worried about how you're going to cash this check for Mr. Trump. But could you leave me alone and let me go on and do my job? You're not yeah. helping me. Um, yeah. So we spoke with some great people around the world. And so most of my cap. so Tricia. Tricia started in, in 19, in four years here in Phoenix, she was just a regular lady. She was a good salesperson, but you know, not a mega earner, not a millionaire, anything like that. She's bought 187 properties, all cash flowing with a $10,000 placement fee per property. And most of her investors in the beginning were a hundred to $500,000. They came in and then she would buy the houses. Um, today, her standards have changed. She works only on referrals. It's now a $2 million minimum. Some leverage, some don't. Most of my students start out just working within their own sphere of influence. Most so of them never even do securities. Most of them never even do a, a family office, Wall Street type placement. So they just go to people they know and then word of mouth gets around. But now... Let's quickly, we, we touched on it multiple times, but let's quickly, in just a few steps, if you could explain how the Burley model actually works. I know you, you covered it already, but like in a little bit more structure. Yeah, so the Burley model, the idea is we reverse engineered it. When I went into full-time, formed the private equity company, at the time, almost all the institutions had ever done was multi-unit commercial. And the reason primarily was 98% of them were fee-based, meaning in that area, you got 2% when people came in on a $50 million offering, a $10 million offering, whatever it was. And then you made 2% asset management fee per year. They ran them for five years, then they dumped them. And then, and they basically just sold them to another operator. And it was like, we all knew on paper, I mean, fifth grade math, single family homes made a higher return. Um, than multi-units, just no one wanted to do the work. So we were the first out. And we started out, we bought a bunch of houses, we were going to rent them. And then after like 90 days, okay, I don't want to be a landlord. This sucks. And I didn't know how to be a landlord well. And the landlord model was completely adversarial to the investor model. So basically it was like landlord. And I was going to getting my CCIM and, and, and going to landlord training. And it's like, they're basically teaching me all kinds of ways to come up with fees and costs and expenses to take money out of the investor's pocket and give it to the property management. But it's like, I'm the investor. I'm being taught how to screw me. And then the residents, you know, there was so much turn and so much work. And so it's like, okay, let's reverse engineer it. What do these people want? Because in America, about 60%, give or take, on their own home, 40% don't. Of the 40% that don't, about 75% of them would like to own, but current government and lending rules don't allow them. So we're talking about 25% of the population. That's a pretty big thing. Mm -hmm. And the American dream, like every country, is to own your own home. And these people are locked out. So it's like, well, what if we came up with a program where we could give them home ownership? And to me, it's like going, okay, so that gets rid of the 8 to 10% per month property management. But more importantly, the 25% that goes to maintenance and expenses and vacancies, I can get rid of that. I can add 33, 35% profit, which completely changes the model forever. Completely changes the numbers, yeah. So we started putting people in on owner financing. And we thousands of families, because of us, own their home free and clear with a bunch more coming down the pipeline. And that's just my portfolio. My students, we've done over $10 billion worth of deals. And so it's like, let's reverse engineer it. Rather than try and think about how we take care of us, 
How do we make the residents so happy that they'll stay and pay for decades? And that's what we did. Then how do I give the capital investor what they really want? And most capital investors don't want a billion percent rate of returns promise because, you know, most most capital investors have been through, you know, the 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 crash of 87, the tech wreck. Again, they're older a little bit usually. They're older. Yeah. And, and they're they're far more concerned about not losing than making, you know, huge returns that broke people. want. So if you're broke, you want to make 25%. If you're rich, you want to make 6 to 8%, have good long-term growth potential, and never lose money. It's a different need. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, so then how do I take care of my capital investors? So we created the talking points that I've been using for 40 years on how do we raise the money, and that's what we teach. And then if I took care of the resident first, the, the model sings. Um, they'll pay a premium to own over renting. They'll take care of all all the cost, expenses, maintenance, and all the crud that I don't want to do. I, mean, I love multifamily, and I buy multifamily when the market's down. Right. But but I can buy single family always. And if I have a portfolio and I turn them into owners, I have all the consolidation of resources. I have all that stuff designed in, which is what we teach our students to do. And we do it mainly. Not that I love houses more than buildings. They make more money run properly. And so then at the end, you know, and Zig Ziglar, and, and I loved Mr. Ziglar so much. Zig, to me, I got to share the stage with him several times. He was like a shining light. He was a beacon in the industry. And I actually, his third, third to last speech of his life, I actually flew down to San Diego to see an old friend who was dying one last time. Um, and it was very emotional. It was great. And we got to spend a little time together alone. And, and he, he was a great guy. But he, my favorite Zigism Was he as positive outside of stage than he was on stage? He was the same man. Same man. He was amazing, which is rare. But right. most of the people I like the best, they're the same guy off yeah. the stage and on the stage, which, as you know, that's not the truth for a no, lot of them. That's not. Zig was the same guy. Yeah. Um, uh, Tommy is the same guy. There's, there's yeah. several of them. And... Um, You know, my favorite Zigism is if you help enough other people get everything they want, you'll get everything you want. And so our model was, I'm going to provide home ownership. I'm going to take care of my capital so is your investment. model then seller financing for those, or is your yeah. model more as a lease purchase agreement? So, seller financing, and after Dodd-Frank, we've mainly gone to a lease with a separate option, but we give them 10 years. Um, we would do more than 10 years, but then we, we bring in the construed sale. And just the reality is Dodd-Frank and every administration does good and bad stuff. And Dodd-Frank made it extraordinarily difficult for people who are on the margins to get financing. Yes. And for self-employed, it, it changed how their, their benefits packages w was viewed as. So, so they're just knocked out. So we do a combination, but we mainly do a 10-year option because, you know, in the seminar land, when they teach one, two, three-year options, yeah. You know, and, and with that option, you can still push a lot of the repairs over to them? The day-to-day, uh, the, day -to -day, the um, they're, they're classified in Arizona, different states have different rules, but nuisance repairs, uh, depending on the state, $500,000 per incident. The leaky faucet, the clogged toilet that, that you did, you fix. Um, and, and then you, you know, you have the option, which is a fixed price, nothing complicated, simple. Um, I preferred it pre, pre Obama and Dodd Frank, the 30 year installment contract. Right. We make more on the lease with a separate option. But again, I couldn't do seminar teaches the one, two, three year options. It's like, that's yeah, not enough we, time for regular people. We have done that, some of that model with a portfolio of houses in Cleveland that we owned that we now sold off. But when we handed it to a third party property management companies, they're basically like, no, we need to treat this like a lease. So we ended up being coming, being basically landlords, even though they had the options and, 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 and not a single one exercised the options, by the way. But uh, but uh, in our case, but it was also and we're, not necessarily the area where everyone wants to live. It was just the, the right. first, part, first suburb about. Like at the time, $60,000 houses that we now sold for 150, which is still great houses. There's a couple that now I think still left over. They want to exercise their options. Yeah. And, and there's, <laughs> you know, and you had those initial learning lessons that everybody's going to have. And, and, you know, learning lessons, we know how that works. You either do it yourself, make mistakes and then correct or quit. Yeah, or, again, houses is not our thing. It's right? not your it's thing. Not so thing. You're, we do land and we do multifamily. Yeah, you're going to have to learn. Just like when I do land, I have learning experiences. Um And so, you know, or you pay someone who already knows how to do it and you do it their way. And so we just re, re reverse engineered the model. Um, and, and people go, what do, your, what do your properties really make? Over a 10 year period, we consistently on a matrix that we do, we consistently make 35 to 70% per annum per property on a portfolio that's been going for 33 years. So the returns are quite well. But if I lead 
and tell you I'm going to make you 35%. Most people who have any money wouldn't talk to me any further because obviously that's too good to be true. I'm a con man. Um, so we talk about 6 to 8% returns. Right. Which that is, comes for usually probably from cash flow and the rest is more from appreciation and depreciation and, and, and tax benefits, and, and, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And, all and the there's some... Um, you know, and again, every administration, good and bad. The Trump administration gave us some really exciting things on <laughs> under five units, um, one of which being Section 179, which most people can take an 8 to 12 percent first year of the purchase price, 100 percent deduction that year, which right. is huge. Yes. I mean, it's a huge offset of income streams. Um, and so we just re we reverse engineered it, Jack. We made the resident win and own the home. So you're essentially doing cost segregation studies more or less on single families too. Yes. Okay. Cool. And, and then we're strictly, you know, we learned the hard way. We don't do class C. We don't do class A. We don't screw around with it. Class B, good homes, good neighborhoods, good families. Um, you know, it, it's our, our normal resident would be a mommy and daddy who are married. Uh, if they're married, uh, they stay and pay better than if they're not married. And it's like, oh, well, how can you say it? Well, because it's the truth. Because if you're married, it's hard. It's harder to break up than if you're not. If you have a couple little kids, my bet on a, on a home. It's is, just statistics. It's just, it's just numbers. Is. Right? Yeah, it's, it just it is. is what it is. Yeah, and no my bet is that a mommy and daddy who love each other, who have children, can make enough money in America to keep food in the ch kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. And in America, middle class, I love that bet. I mean, right now, with the turn down the economy, white collars, they're losing their jobs like crazy, while there's a shortage of blue collar work. Right. Um, yeah, most of our properties, mom and dad, it's just the normal family um, that most so the, of us grew so, up with. So in that case, the number the numbers work such that you put somebody into a house that they, they, they otherwise can't afford because they don't qualify for lending. So they pay you a decent down payment or a big right. fee of which that's some of the $10,000 that goes to you. And then uh, they start paying and then the, the revenue, the cash flow is, is basically split between the investors and you and the investors get a, get a good deal. But the investors ultimately owns the property, right? Well, with with we, you in a we, combination. We, yeah, we do a JV. So, if, so in this example, if Jack, you were coming out as a capital investor and you're doing one house, five houses, 10 houses, whatever, we would form a business. We would have a JV. There would be an LLC. The purpose of the business as a non-security, and there's a test, there's pink, there's rules we have to follow and our paperwork outlines it very clearly we would then do it you would put up the money and you know you would either be doing down payments closing costs and new loans or just cash if we bought 10 houses you would pay me 10,000 times 10 100,000 in placement fees we then put the people in and you know when they move in we get about two and a half percent move in so in today's market it's about eight thousand dollars per property and we split everything down the middle after cost, and we itemize everything to the penny. So literally for you as a capital investor, every hundred dollars I don't spend on rehab, you make 50 and I make 50. Wonderful. So I don't come in and put in new bathrooms and new kitchens and, and, you know, put 30 or 40 grand in to remodel it because it gets me zero per month income stream. Um, we also on average go through seven residents through a full application process to put one in because Part of the problem is where there's a disconnect in the seminar land. As a practitioner, the most expensive thing is the turn, meaning they don't pay right. for, and they have to move out. That's what I'm trying to avoid. And that's on me, not on the resident. I cannot underwrite death, divorce, or disability to three Ds. But if they're turning, moving out, can't make their payments in the first five years, and it's not death, divorce, or disability, then clearly I'm not following my own underwriting guidelines. I'm not following my model. And so... If we do proper underwriting, they move in and they win. And what we're looking for for the resident, it's not that you want it. It's you need to want it, and I need to be sure you can make it work. And many people, they're not ready. And if they're not ready to own, I'm not taking their money. Because it, it, I've learned the hard way decades ago. It is always better to have a house be vacant for 30 more days than put the wrong family in. Absolutely. Yeah, we I need a match. That. I learned that the hard way too. Yes, we all have that we one. All, we all got those scars. Single multifamily. Yes. Yeah, so it, this, yeah, this is the one of the very first thing we do in every single multifamily we take over. In most cases, unless they really have done a good job before, which they rarely have, is increase the requirements it takes to move into their property. You think it's a scary thing to do the very first time because you think, oh my God, I'll nobody's going to apply. No. People want to apply for places that have higher Our requirements standards. because yeah. they want neighbors, particularly in multifamily, they want neighbors that um, understand that, well, they want good neighbors. They want right. neighbors that, that they know also have a good income. And with good income usually comes 
certain habits, certain success habits, certain things. Yeah, you, don't, you, you put the garbage then, in the dumpster, not next to the dumpster. Exactly you, right. You, you so, park in one spot, not three. Right. Uh, yeah, the, all the things about being a good neighbor. Right. Exactly right. So <laughs> so great. So how does how does somebody get a hold of you? Um, great question. Yeah, you can go to uh, John Burley. So J O H N B U R L E Y dot com. Um, John dot Burley on Instagram. Uh, you can go to John Burley Real Estate Investing. You can also, we're regular people. We answer the phone. We're bricks and mortar. You can call us at 623-561-8246. All right. And we'll put that into the show notes. Awesome. All right. So with that said, well, thank you very much. Awesome for being time, here. Jack. I appreciate it, buddy. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. All right. So if you enjoyed this, make sure you subscribe. You leave us a five-star review on iTunes. And if you're watching this on YouTube, then make sure you hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell so you get notifications when the next video is coming up. All right. See you there.